Hey everybody, it's Jason. I was going to say you're GM, Jason, but I'm not GMing tonight. I'm just so used to saying that. We are back with another episode of Dubious Knowledge. And with me, I have one of my co-hosts, Corey. How's it going? It's going all right. Uh, Long day. Yeah, yeah. But excited to talk about lore with you. Yeah, it's been a long day. It's been a, it's been a long day all around. It, it seems, and unfortunately, we are not we are not joined tonight by Mike. Mike had some health stuff come up, and so he is unable to join us. And but we soldier forth. We soldier forth, and tonight we have a very special guest joining us to discuss this episode. We are joined by Sir Vertigo from the Midnight Torch. Sir, how are you? I am doing pretty well. Thank you for having me on the show today. Absolutely. How about you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, a little bit about the Midnight Torch and the product that you put out on YouTube for us? All right. My name's Steven. I normally do lore videos as a character named Sir Vertigo on my channel, Sir Vertigo. I have a Discord group where I like to hang out and talk with my other friends who are into the lore. It's called the Midnight Torch Discord, where we are working on making an in-universe guild that people will be able to use in-game. So we try to get pretty role-play with it and try to come up with history that kind of fits in with Galarian uh, I like to put out the lore videos as often as I can, but the Discord's where you can usually find me outside of putting out videos. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm a like I said, I'm a big fan of the videos and have been for quite a while. So I'm very excited to get you on the podcast and to, in particular, to discuss this deity that we're going to discuss tonight because Lamashtu was the first video of yours that I watched. So. I th- I think Lamash 2 is one of my favorite videos just because it was kind of the capstone for what I was trying to do for a Halloween series where I was trying to pump out a lot of videos. Right. And uh, I believe she was either the last one or the second to last one, but I've always loved the spookier sides of things, and she is an amazing deity. I just I love her history and personality and character. Absolutely. So before before we get too deep into it, let me first put out to our listeners. I'm gonna we're gonna put out a content warning. We don't do this very often. Our show does have the explicit tag, and we do use that heavily. But we are gonna put out a content warning for this particular deity because it she is chaotic evil, and yeah, it does get quite graphic some of some of the some of the rituals and some of her lore and how she came about being and the things that her worshipers do can get quite graphic so her everything one, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let's so we're going to put that we're going to put that content warning out there now so if that's too much for you or you got some little ones that are that listen in on the show this might be a good time to stop it and come back to it l- later with some earbuds. All right. That being said, how do we want to kick this one off? Who wants to who wants to take us take us through the basics? Well, it's um, it's your guys' show, so I think I'll let y'all take the starting reins, and I'll follow along. Well, Lamash too is widely known as the mother of monsters. Um, she is the chaotic evil goddess of madness, monsters, and nightmares. Her domains in 1E were chaos, evil, madness, strength, and trickery. Her domains in 2E are family, might, nightmares, and trickery. She her favorite weapon is a falchion, despite all of her art being shown with kukris. There's a, a fun little lore bit behind that that we'll get into. 
for cleric spells, she grants magic fang at first level. She grants animal form at second level, and at fourth level, she grants nightmare. Um, yeah, that that just makes sense, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but the biggest thing to note about her is she is the first ascended demon lord. Uh, she started as a lowly demon lord in the abyss and through slaughter and conquest she enveloped others' powers enough to claim full godhood uh, much to the chagrin of some of her uh, her compatriots in the abyss right I think uh, for me and you all know this if you've listened to to the show my undergrad major uh, was a double major of political science but I'm also I also have a history degree in undergrad so one of the things that I really really liked that and I'm going to credit Mike who's not on the show for this is that he pointed out that Lamashtu is actually modeled after a real life deity a lot a lot of the a lot of the Galarian de- deities did get their inspiration from real life mythology but Lamashtu in particular uh, comes from a Mesopotamian and Sumerian uh, mythology where again she is a female demon a malevolent goddess who who menaced women during childbirth and when possible would kidnap those infants so this is a theme that kind of runs through uh, that when we'll, we'll get into lore in particular the kidnapping of infants and it, childbirth as well is this ongoing theme with Lamashtu that the writers for Galarian really latched on to one difference though is that in Mesopotamian mythology, Lamashtu was depicted as having a lion's head. But in Galarian mythology, she has a jackal's head. Now, both of them do show her having avian legs and feet. But yeah, the, there is that difference in, in the head. So I did one. That is one thing where there's a bit of a deviation. I think one of the main reasons that Alamashtu is such an eerie deity is just because so much of her stuff does focus around children and childbirth. And it kind of taps into those fears you have when your significant other is pregnant or you yourself are pregnant. And even through history, I think that's something that's kind of always been there. So it makes sense that her fears kind of been there a long time. Right. Absolutely. And, um, Corey, you, you, you alluded to this a bit, but that connection in that relationship to another demon God, Pazuzu is also, Mm -hmm inspired and informed by Mesopotamian and Sumerian mythology. So I, I do, I really, I really like when the Galarian writers take inspiration from real life mythology. It's uh, I, I I love that stuff. I think it's particularly cool. Uh, It's actually a common theme among demon Lords, not just with Lamashtu and Pazuzu, but also with, uh, the demon lord Nurgle is loosely based on real world mythology, uh, and the demon lord Ereshkigal is also loosely based on real world mythology. So uh, it just seems like a common well that they go to for demon lords in particular, just because there are so many malevolent deities in our history that it's an easy place to 
to pull from to try to get a well-rounded, vastly evil pantheon. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Cherry picking the best of monsters from history. <laughs> right, right. And even even fiction, too, because you got the Lovecraft deities who are part, oh, yeah. part of the actual lore now, which we'll get into later. We have a, we have a guest who who requested as compensation for joining us <laughs> to talk about other deities is that, you know, for comp- as compensation, can we do an episode on the elder gods? And I was like, sure. So I was like, all right. But yeah, do we want to dive into dive into some of Lamashtu's lore a little bit? I think we went th- we went over the basics, right? And and we've talked about the way. Oh, one thing about her looks. One thing that I wanted to bring up. We mentioned this when we did the the high level overview of the 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 main twenty. Is that in addition to her having a jackal's head, it's a three eyed jackal. Which, Which is, is also her symbol. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, cut you, you off. <laughs> no, 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 no. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you, you read, you read on. I was just going to mention that is that it's a three eyed jackal, which is also her, her holy symbol. And she has avian legs with avian talons for feet an alligator's tail a crow's wings and her body and arms are that of a pregnant female now the the stage of pregnancy is it it varies it varies but it is always clearly pregnant and more often than not like eight or nine months. Right. Yeah. Right. And not only is she pregnant, but her pregnancy belly is riddled with scars and wounds, which I think is the most eerie and most uncomfortable part of it is that that pregnant belly is full of like, gashes and wounds and scars and that just freaks me out (laughs) and uh depending on what culture is actually worshiping her at the moment or what creature i should say uh her head's been known to look different for the different races so like gnolls will most commonly see the jackal head but medusas would see snake heads or Hmm. harpies would see her with a a hawk head so she kind of tunes herself to the creatures currently worshiping her also oh that would okay so that 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 kind of touches into what i mentioned about like the real world mythology where Mm -hmm. she has a lioness's head yeah so depending on who's actively beseeching her she may take a different form when she appears that's really cool like i said her art usually depicts her with two twin kukris in her hands. Uh, One is wreathed in flame and the other is wreathed in ice. They are uh, Red Lust and Chill Heart respectively are the names of the kukris. And like I said, her favorite weapon is actually the falchion. But all of her art depicts kukris. And part of that is that kukris are really destructive weapons they're they're just violent weapons but they're more precise than a falchion is which is also just a really violent weapon right but while she carries these kukris as soon as she engages in battle the two kukris begin come twin falchions in her hands instead of kukris allowing her to just rampage on the battlefield oh that's cool I didn't I didn't know that that's awesome mm-hmm. 
I, I always wanted to know the origins of those blades, but I personally couldn't find any info on them more than what they're able to do. I couldn't really find an origin for them, but they're really cool. <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna. I was just about to ask if they if they they've been stat blocked. Are they considered artifacts or? They would have to be artifacts. Yeah, yeah not yeah. that I was able to find at least, and I've looked through quite a few books. Yeah, I don't think they have stat blocks, but if they ever get them, they would have to be artifacts because they're yeah. the favored <laughs> weapons of a deity. Right. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Super cool and. One last thing is that her voice, actually, they they say that though she has this monstrous appearance, her voice really isn't all that monstrous. They depict her voice as deep and rich. Uh, and beyond just when she's screaming, she they say the the text says that she screams a lion's roar that could be heard for miles and a howl when she's enraged. But beyond that, they just depict her voice as deep and rich. To me, that doesn't really come off as all that frightening, but maybe it may, uh, maybe a deep, rich, sultry voice with coming from that body is frightening. Now I was going to say, it. I think I would personally be more scared if instead of a raspy snarl, it starts talking to me in a, mildly seductive rich deep voice that would be horrifying (laughs) speaking of her voice I want to touch on her holy texts for a second because unlike most deities who have a singular holy text Lamashtu actually has two holy texts and neither of them are what you would think of as a standard holy text. The first is the Four Hides of Lom. And uh this is yeah. this was this was one of my this was one of my favorite bits of lore was the holy texts. It's yeah. so unsettling and so cool. Yeah, the first is a series of three leather straps that are stitched together and marked with simple runes telling the history and lessons of the Demon Queen. They are actually strips of a Lamashtu priest who tore these strips of flesh from her own body to and then tanned them into leather and then wrote the history of her goddess on them. And they uh two of the three strips bar scarring where they were obviously torn apart at some point and then stitched back together and legend is that the name which is the the four hides of lom comes from the fact that there used to be a fourth strip that was attached to them and it was torn away because it contained heresies and everything else was stitched back together into the three pieces that we now know my guess as to what the heresy is is that that is the part of Lamashtu's story that told of when she wasn't enemies with Pazuzu but instead allies or even possibly lovers with Pazuzu. Yeah, that Uh, would make sense. Something that neither of those uh, deities really like to talk about anymore. So uh, it would make sense that that would be the portion of her hide that would be ripped away. The other holy text, and this is where the, the voice of Lamashtu came in, for the nice segue there is the skull of Mashog um, and it's a preserved skull of a Lamashtu champion who was slain by a cleric of Desna it was found intact by a Lamashtun priestess and Lamashtu herself imbued it with the power 
to speak her holy text as a an oral tradition and the cults of Lamashtu will still gather to this day to hear this preserved skull speak their their uh their histories yeah the real cool thing about the skull too is that it speaks in multiple different languages including abyssal Mm -hmm. so it's not just one language it this skull can speak multiple different languages and they gather and they have this like ritual where and they actually do these face-offs and contests uh, when they gather to at these skull meetings. I uh, I love the way Paizo has done mysteries throughout the their setting where they don't spell out every little thing. They leave a lot of it up to the GMs, and I love that. Like. Okay, the fourth strip could be about Pazuzu, but it could also be about some fatal weakness Lamashtu has or something like that. And that's great because it really gives a GM a chance to make their own story with pretty much everything in Pathfinder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's super cool. Like, I feel like I feel like that's one of the things that kind of got bad in the Forgotten Realms is it's been around for 30 years and a lot of stuff kind of got over explained Galarian still new and there's still so many secrets that have never even been touched on. And it's great for those GMs who like to make their settings in Galarian, but maybe not follow an adventure path. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, me as an example for my, for our show, I went and took what's inside the eye of Abendego. I went and created it, and I created the Eye of Abendego as a is a prison that Besmara created, where she puts her enemies. That's in the that's the Eye. That's that's how I explained it. But I had the freedom to do that because Paisel didn't hasn't it hasn't touched it. on it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Because <laughs> it's one thing to just say, "Hey, I'm going a different direction," but if it's a blank slate that it's kind of like they're encouraging you to do it. It feels great when you don't have to rot over something they've done just because down the road, it may mess with some other little bit of lore or, or something like that. Absolutely. But yeah, let's talk about P- her, uh, Pazuzu. I, um, that's a good segue. Cause if, if, if the fourth hide is Pazuzu, we should talk about what this whole relationship with Pazuzu was like, and I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and start it off here that Lamashtu doesn't really have a whole lot of relationships with other deities. Her 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 relationships with these other de- with the other deities in Galarian is mostly antagonistic. Even even with the other evil deities, she doesn't quite get along with. She sees Urgothoa as a rival. <laughs> she sees Rovagug as an enemy because Rovagug wants to take control, and she doesn't. And she wants to take control. <laughs> and we'll get into this bit about Shaylin too. What she wants to do to Shaylin is also just. Mm. Horrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like I, I don't like being a wet blanket. There's a lot of Lamash to lore that I just find absolutely fucking disgusting. And that's yep. hard. <laughs> yes, absolutely. But one of the one of the things that she does do is that she will occasionally make deals with other demon lords. But one one demon lord she will she won't, and that we've alluded to is Pazuzu, and the text says that this is this is likely because she they had a relationship in the past. It could it could have been a friendly relationship, or f- potentially a former lover. But whatever this conflict was, together they seized control of an area of the abyss. 
Now, we don't really quite know what happened, but things went sour. And Pazuzu went and threw her down an infinitely deep chasm. We do actually know what happens. It's just spread out through multiple different books. It's touched on a little more in depth in Book of the Damned, which is okay. devoted to demon lords and uh, and the kings of hell and the four horsemen. What actually happened is after after she killed Kerchano, the the Lord of Beasts that was Desna's mentor and assumed his power over beasts and ascended to full godhood because of that, it made Pazuzu jealous because he was also trying to get to full godhood. And that's what... He basically couldn't handle the shift in power. Yeah. And he threw her down a well. And it took her centuries to recover... And now she longs for the day where she will pay him in kind and trap him for a thousand years and then eat his heart. Yeah, so the whole, you know, in in Thor, where Loki says he's been falling for half an hour. <laughs> yeah, she, she was falling for centuries. One of my um, favorite little tidbits for, about Lamashtu from around that pre-Earthfall period was originally she was just your average demon lord. Great powers but nothing truly unique but it said that she tore out her own womb and consumed it and after con- stealing and consuming a thousand infants she regenerated it and gained the ability to basically gain power over birth itself. Yeah, that's a that's a great segue because we should we should go into that into that bit next. Is that the bit about childbirth and why she is called the mother of monsters? And it's because, well, <laughs> well, she she is the mother of beasts and worshipped in a in such a way that they believe that worshippers of Lamashtu believe that purity and perfection are temporary but corruption and flaw is natural and is the final state of all things and so th- rather than wanting something pure and beautiful they they would rather have something that is deformed and flawed and they find beauty in that and to, you know to to a degree that's kind of cool but only to a certain degree they they, <laughs> they yeah She's uh, with her mastery over beast from killing Kerchanus, and because she's got mastery over birth, she's basically able to gestate these creatures within her own body. But on top of being able to just do beasts, she basically attacked the horsemen of the apocalypse and kidnapped the horseman Roshmalam. And after experimenting on him and torturing him, he gave her the secrets to create demons. And now she can gestate her own breed of demons within her body called the Vivakia, which is her own personal masterpiece of demons. (laughs) Really bad at pronouncing stuff. So I'm hoping I'm saying that right. (laughs) No, you're good, man. You're good. Yeah, uh, this is probably the part of Lamashtu's lore that I have the biggest problem with. I'm not a huge fan of the the monstrous motherhood trope, and that is 
pretty much what her entire religion is built upon in Pathfinder. So mm -hmm. I, I won't hesitate to say that she's probably my least favorite of the core deities. Just because I really hate that trope with a fiery passion. And that trope is also coupled here with the infertility is monstrous trope, which is also something that I really dislike because mm -hmm. it's just horrendous. And I know she's an evil goddess and she's supposed to represent evils, but th those are things that I could do without seeing any more of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think Lamashtu hit a little differently for me before I had kids, because now that I have kids. The whole childbirth part is much more personal than it used to be. And um, it does kind of make you uncomfortable going over some of the stuff she's responsible for. Right. And and I 100% I, I agree. To th and to kind of... One of the things, and to get maybe get a little bit personal too here... One of the things about Lamashu that really kind of rubbed me the wrong way, and um, is and I, I've not I've not been shy about sharing this about my my personal journey. I I am a multiracial person. I am I have multiple races or ethnicities in me. And the fact that there's this bit of lore where Lamashtu will go and steal the seed from sleeping men to create half breeds. Yeah. And that that bit about half breeds is so as a biracial person, it's it all that <laughs> I have to wonder how much of it is you know, really old school TTRPG thinking. You know that Paizo's trying to get away from. To, like, for example, they're not using the term mongrel men anymore uh, because of the racial connotations with mongrels. So it's, I don't know. It's yeah. It, it it it's it's a little it's a little jarring. So I can I I understand where you're coming from, Corey. Yeah. Okay, just large chunks of her sections of lore skeeved me out, and for that purpose, I, I think I just skimmed over her gods and magic entry in Tui. I read it today for for this, but and uh, skimmed over her entry in the core rule book in Pathfinder Two, so I didn't see her anathema until today either. And her edicts and anathema in QE are really, really gross as well. Specifically, her anathema of attempt to treat a mental illness or deformity is yeah. one of her anathemas. And provide succor to Lamashtu's enemies. That one's less important because whatever. But, like... As someone who was born with a deformity, this is uh, really, really gross for me. But, yeah. And again, I understand she's an evil goddess, but there's yeah. just some things that are... I think it's one of those things that they they kind of put in there just so you can go, oh yeah, that that's what makes them the bad person. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, somebody who suffers from mental illness myself, so mm. yeah, I get it. But yeah, so we should um yeah, well we don't have to dive into the into the the lore too deeply here, but suffice it to say that Lamash 2 worshipers and Lam Lam Lamash 2 devotees, they they pray to this goddess in the hopes that they that she 
bestows upon them a monster of a child. They want they they want that pregnancy to uh, to bring forth, you know, a beast if possible. And there's a really gross part in the text where they actually hope and pray that the infant rips its way out of the mother. And they and the mother does not should not be magically healed because that will that will prevent scarring and instead the priests and the clerics there are are there to treat and to heal the mother but not magically alchemically is fine but not magically it's basically like rejecting Lamastu's blessing if you just have it magically healed. You have to be able to suffer for it for it to count. Yeah. And to have sh- signs of that suffering. Yeah. yeah. Scars are scars are tantamount to her her worshippers. Um, her in Pathfinder 1E they had obediences that granted specific prestige classes different boons and we see a little of that in Tui with the boons and curses system that was introduced in Gods and Magic but in 1E you had to be a specific prestige class to get the boons and you had to follow a specific obedience for your deity and the obedience is very based on deity and Lamashtu's is is a lot Lamashtu's and Zonkathon's are both pretty pretty far out there but honestly I'm glad they got rid of the obediences because even for the good aligned deities they're not they're not gross they're just it seems like a chore yeah, <laughs> I'm not, yeah. and like, like it's something that you're supposed to do once a day yeah like okay like, if it's once a week I can understand that but there there was one I was reading and I can't remember which deity it is now but it was something like you have to build an altar every day and you have to put this amount of ash around it and I was just like I don't know if I'd want to do that daily <laughs> I don't know if I'd want to do that weekly personally because that would just be so much to do every day but especially Lamash dues, like that's yeah Hers is so, a lot. Yeah. Lamash is sacrifice an unwilling living creature in the name of the mother of monsters. Draw the process out to imp- inspire the maximum amount of terror and suffering in your victim. The death blow you deal should be savage and destructive. Do not grant your sacrifice a clean death. Once the creature is dead, remove one of its bones and sharpen it to a point. Use the bone to cut yourself deeply enough to leave a scar. Leave the sacrificed creature's mutilated form in the open where scavengers may devour it or travelers may see it and know of Lamashtu's power. And you're supposed to do that daily. It's just like reading that. If, as a GM, I was not aware of the obediences and you told me that you were going to go do that as a character... I would just think you're trying to be the edgiest of edgelords, and that's how most of the obediences for the different deities kind of come across. The evil deities are way over the top. The good deities are still pretty over the top for the most part. <laughs> yeah, building an altar, that, that sounds like something Torag would want, would want you to do. I cannot remember which one it is, and it's going to bug me now. I'll remember it <laughs> later. <laughs> But yeah, so the so another. I'm trying to get through the, the 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 birthing thing as fast as possible, so we can just put that aside and forget about it, and we can get to the nightmares part. Yeah, so in in, in Lamashtian religion, the if you're a priest, the you you, the more children you have, or the more children you have sired or birthed the the higher your ranking in that priesthood in that clergy you are 
Yeah, magical power be damned. Exactly. Exactly. They 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 do not care about. They don't care about your your magical ability. So if, even if you're like a level twenty cleric, and you you have a, a level two cleric who comes up, but this level two cleric has birthed eight children, and your level twenty cleric has only birthed one child, that level two cleric is considered a higher tier. <laughs> And if there, if the number of children you've sired or birthed are equal, then they look at scarring and scarification and mutilation. How much mutilation have you done to your body? How much, how many scars do you have? That is your second degree. And then afterwards it's magical power. A lot of Lamash do kind of, overlaps with Zonkuthon where they're almost kind of tiptoeing around each other's domains it feels like <laughs> the scarification part yeah 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 and scarification self, dealing mutilation pain stuff like that that's a lot of what Zonkuthon's also about right Yeah, and that's where we get into like Corey had mentioned earlier that if you are Infertile, whether you're an infertile man or an infertile woman, you are seen as the worst of the worst in that religion. <laughs> and so you 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 are not allowed to uh, like ascend into any sort of position of power within that church, and so you're relegated to like guard duty or you know. Some something something like that something like that's considered unimportant in that church. So it's uh, yeah, it's all about birth and being able to sire or give birth to children. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, like. And uh, also, one of the things that is considered a sign of Lamashtu's anger is if you worship her and you give birth to something beautiful. Those that have really provoked her ire have been known to give birth to elves, just no matter what their original ancestry just because elves are considered the most beautiful of races. So if you really made her mad, she'll make you pop one of those out. I love dwarves. Dwarves are beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, there's <clears throat> marriages. Not so, no thing doesn't exist in Lamashtian religion. Any kind of pairings don't happen. Promiscuity is considered part of the faith and part of a cleric's role in this in the church. Um, oftentimes, uh, male priests don't know how many children they've sired. And female priests generally don't know who the sire of their child is. I think I've gone through most of the childbirth stuff, right? I yeah. believe so. Oh, there. Okay, there's one thing. There's one thing, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do a real quick extra extra content warning on this part. If and this is this is probably the part that that disturbed me and upset me the most reading <clears throat> if you if if you the your you birth a child who is not deformed you are supposed to sacrifice that infant in order to uh, regain the favor of your deity if that if if that child does not show, show any signs of deformity, and yeah, I oh that one that one 
that one just was rough. disgusting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Again, being it being a parent six years ago. Yeah. I, I think I think I would have been disgusted even before that, but still, it hits me differently. Like you said, Stephen. it's more primal after you have kids. I think it's yeah, it's rough. But all right, that's uh, now that we're done with let's 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 get let's get over the the child stuff and um, move on to her other domain. Is we've t- we've touched on monsters, we've touched on birth. The last one is nightmares. And this is where she gets into a bit of a squabble with Desna. Mm-hmm. And this is where they they kind of butt heads and really they become they become fast enemies. Not not because of the Kir- not only because of the Kirchanis story but also her her control over nightmares and um and as we know Desna is, is the goddess of dreams so who wants to take that bit um i'll take i'll take that one lamashtu's ownership of uh, nightmares she shall not only send nightmares to her enemies to frighten them and get them off kilter, but she'll send them to her own servants as ways to show them her will and to guide her faith for the most part. There's one example where she sent nightmares to one of her priests that was asking for guidance of her biting the head off dwarves and that was her telling them to kill some dwarven patrols that were in a certain area and stuff like that but when her priests will pray to her she will usually guide them or speak to them through intense almost vivid nightmares and usually they will wake up changed in some way so if for example a priest is asking what do I what do I need to do or should I should I attack these people, etc.? They may wake up with horrid fangs or long talons, kind of showing that they should use their new tools to attack. It's kind of the exact opposite of how Desna treats her followers, right? Like, Desna provides guidance in dreams, Lamashtu provides guidance through nightmares, and they're just eerily similar mirrors of each other. I feel like with Desna, it would definitely be guidance, but I feel with Lamashtu, it would definitely be force, where if you don't obey the first night, it's just going to get worse the following. Mm-hmm. I think that plays into her major curse, too. So if the, the boons and curses part, the major curse of Lamashtu is that your dreams are an unending stream of nightmares that you need 16 hours of rest to get uh, a full night instead of the normal eight. And then even then you have to make a DC 15 flat check. <laughs> Otherwise you're, you're considered fatigued. Oh no, you're still fatigued on it. No matter what you need the 15 to get your spells back period. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah. You're still fatigued regardless. <laughs> but even with 16 hours, you, you need a DC 15 flat check. Yeah. It's it's rough. I feel like as bad as her major curse is, her major boon is almost as bad for a character cuz her major boon, she makes you give birth to a monster. That monster is the same level as you, but it's under the G, uh, the GM's control. But the main part of that is your character is also drained three from that ordeal, which basically yeah. means it's your level times the drained value. So if you're level 10 and this happens, you just lost 30 health points 
and your HP cap drops by 30. Yep. And each night you can only regain one drain. One and you can do you can do this boon once per day. So yeah. Yeah. Is there a drained cap in 2E? I can't remember if there is or not. I don't well, I guess it would just be up to your maximum health. <laughs> yeah, I'm not exactly sure on that. I don't see anything with a quick Google on it, so I don't think so. Yeah, there's nothing in archives on a maximum drain value. Shoot. Then, yeah, you could easily get down to the point you're in single digits of health just because you keep dropping monster spawn. <laughs> yeah, it's it, that's. Yeah, regardless of your gender. Yeah, they, they that major boon that kind of goes back to something I missed, too, is that, that there is stories of male worshipers of Lamashtu who purposefully purposefully get like will fight a zill for example and allow the zill to lay their eggs inside of them intentionally in order to experience birth or what they consider a form of birth yeah gives me chest uh, chest burster vibes (laughs) exactly yeah exactly beyond that okay what do we got here obviously Lamashtu Lam, uh, the cults of Lamashtu consider the entire month of Lamashan sacred not only because it's named for their goddess but also because it represents the transition uh, from fall to winter which is usually a time in the in the in the year where the weakest of offspring die will perish Yep. Yeah. That's really her only holiday is the month of Lamashan. Yeah. I think each little cult of Lamashu kind of comes up with their own holidays just based on who's had a disgusting birth of this month last year or who did some great deed kind of deal. So I think a lot of that, like most of the evil cults where they're, they're not a big unified cult, it's kind of cult to cult. So that would be one of those cases where it would be really easy for you to have your players go up against a Lamashian cult that's in the middle of celebrating their night of the unpeeled head or some other creature that was born that night and now all the Lamashians are out in force for the night. Yeah. One of the things I really liked in the 2E Gods and Magic book is like for each of the each of the deities they provide some aphorisms. And they did that in Inner Sea Gods in first edition too, where here are sayings that the followers of this deity tend to repeat on on occasion but one of the things they did in Gods and Magic for Lamashtu is they included a an aphorism for for people who don't follow Lamashtu and are trying to avoid her quote unquote blessings and that is uh, sweet dreams and safe deliveries uh, in communities that have past suffered tragic Lamash to births uh, this comforting saying is popular way to wish people especially expectant parents a life safe from her notice so I, I like that they included that along with the you know the the scars are the proof aphorism where it's your scars show your value uh, and the uh, the other more grotesque aphorisms of Lamashtu cults 
just throwing that nice little sweet prayer against Lamash too really made really made me smile when reading that. Yeah. One interesting fact because of her feud with Pazuzu is that expectant mothers will actually use yes. symbols of Pazuzu as a way to ward off Lamash 2's influence now. So even though he's a demon lord, he is kind of like in real life, he was also used as a way to ward off Lamashtu and Lilith and the evil demons of the world. That's how he's seen in Pathfinder as well, to a degree. Yeah, I, I like yeah, that, that little bit of uh, trivia as well when I read that. Like, yeah, he's evil, but at least he isn't her. His evil's opposite hers, so it's still kind of uh, countering hers as we as well. He's evil. He was the bad guy in The Exorcist, <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't talk about Pazuzu without thinking of Futurama, though. Oh, the gargoyle yeah. Pazuzu. <laughs> I, yeah, I immediately go to The Exorcist when I think of Pazuzu. But yeah, so I think we've hit on all of it except for possibly the her realm. Her yeah. the, the realm where she she resides. You want to take that one, Corey, since I know you're much more versed in planar knowledge than I am. Yeah, uh, her, hers is really the e one of the easier deific realms to describe in that she just carved out a huge chunk of the abyss for herself because, again, she's an ascended demon lord, hails from the abyss. Her planar realm is Kernugia, the largest layer of the abyss, it is massive in scale. It includes all known terrestrial terrains from steaming jungles to parched deserts to ice cake mountains, vast seas, immense swamps, and anything else you can think of because as the mother of monsters, she needs all of these areas because monsters thrive in all areas of the world. Hmm. And uh, her realm is infested with demons ruled by great nations of warring fiendish gnolls or otherwise prove just uninhabitable to non-demonic non life forms. Like, if you visit her realm, you're probably not coming back. <laughs> Right. That uh, that kind of brings up an interesting point that I just thought of. So Besmara, she kind of has control and considers sea monsters her domain. But Lamashtu considers all monsters her domain. And now I'm now I'm thinking about <laughs> like a deific clash. <laughs> pirate goddess versus this evil awful terrible goddess <laughs> anyway sorry that was an interruption go ahead <laughs> <laughs> uh, her seat of power within Kernigia is a towering mesa in the palace city of Yanaron just a diamond-shaped city of spires and sharp points and uh, just a massive metropolis in the heart of demon-infested abyss. I I cannot wait for the plane or books to start coming out. I, I, I can't wait for the amount of detail they're going to put into these. I want pictures. I want illustrations of some of these places. <laughs> yeah, the, th the crazy thing about 
Yanaran as they say that it that that palace city itself is the size of of, of a, a whole world. Like it's absolutely massive, and that to, to, that just boggles my mind to just like have this massive metropolis. Like I'm thinking Coruscant from Star Wars, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like a like a like a world, the world spanning metropolis, where the La, uh, Lamash to herself like hand picks these abyssal creatures to that lives in her city. So like if you if you are a really really good worshipper of Lamashtu, you that's where you want to that's where you want to end up. You want to live in this city where she can torture you and <laughs> for the seems rest like of a, eternity. Seems like a weird goal to strive for personally, but <laughs> maybe that's cuz I'm not a Lamash to worshiper, I don't know. <laughs> Weird flex, but okay. <laughs> right? <laughs> the the only thing I don't think we really touched on very much was um Lamash to's main servants. We um mm-hmm. she's got two unique creatures that were that act as kind of her direct servants. She's got Blood Maw, which is a unique Yeth hound. He's got a single green glowing eye and then the normal red. And he's reported to be amazingly large for a Yeth Hound. But then her direct herald is one known as the Yeth Esmari. It's a jackal-like beast with bat wings and a snake tail, standing nearly 14 foot tall and nearly 1,600 pounds. His eyes were burnt out when it witnessed the most profane atrocities that Lamashtu committed. And now its vision is full of unknown worlds and endless visions that have been granted him by Lamashtu. And uh, when he gets the rare occasion that he gets to go to the material plane, he does not discriminate between his targets. He just kills everything around him followers, enemies. He just slaughters everything. <laughs> yeah. In uh, in second edition, the Yeth Hound is a level three creature. And it's pretty it's pretty nasty for level three. Um forty foot speed, air walk. It deals one D eight plus six piercing damage plus one D six evil and knockdown and Sinister Bite, which is any good creature has to attempt a will save or on a failure becomes frightened one or increase the value of frightened condition by one if it's already frightened. Yeah. So these things are nasty for level three even. Mm-hmm. Yikes. And you know that her direct servant has to be a much higher or mm-hmm. it's supposed to be the leader of one of the largest pack of Yeth hounds within Carnugia also. Yeah. So I, not only is it it, it's got a bunch of buddies with it at all times. In first edition it was a CR fifteen creature, so Jeez. So probably probably around level sixteen, give or take. Yikes. Yeth is Mari. Yeah, it, that's not that's not out yet in second edition, so oh. are any of the Heralds? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. No. I just pulled I just pulled up the regu- the standard Yeth Hound. So I didn't even pull up uh, Blood Maw. Yeah, because he's not in it, so Yeah, Blood Maw doesn't have a stat blocking in her sea gods, but Yeth and Yes, uh, yes, as Mari does. And, uh, that's, that's what he looks like there. Which one? The, the winged one? Yeah. Yeah, it's like Whoa. a, um, it's pretty legit looking. Its eyes are smoking coal pits from where they were burnt out, basically. Good lord. Yeah, I think that's about it. I don't 
did we miss anything? Anything else that we wanted to talk about? The only other servants I can really think of are the, um, they're not named, but apparently Lamashtu has seven powerful witches that live within the abyss with her, but that's really all the info we have on them, but they always strike me as very similar to the daughters of Ergathua, so I I think I kind of got mixed up with them when I was first doing that video, but I can't really find anything else about them. Well, all right. I think that do, uh, that about does it for Lamash too. Uh, if we if we want to talk briefly about spoilers, she does play a role in the very first adventure path. Um, she is the she is the very first catalyst for a Pathfinder adventure path because it is Lamash to worshiping goblins that let's do that. Let's do that real quick. So let's, let's do a quick wrap up and then we'll do a spoiler corner, uh, right at the, at the very end. So real quick before, before we do our sign offs and before we do a spoiler corner, our next episode is going to be, you know what? I figure if we're going to talk so poorly about childbirth in this episode, let's actually talk about the other side of childbirth in Galarian. And we are going to be joined by Steve Strapple from the Hideous Laughter podcast, who is going to be here to talk about Phrasma. And if you listen to their main show, he plays an inquisitor of Phrasma. So that, that's going to be quite the episode i'm very excited for that but we have another steve on the show right now steven how about the you tell our listeners where they can find you you can find me on youtube of at uh, the sir vertigo youtube channel i'd love to have everybody join my discord if you like to hang out with other pathfinder fans talk lower or just get together to schedule games and other stuff like that we've got a bunch of stuff to offer we've got an economy on the discord so you can earn money to buy votes for videos so you can have a bigger say in what's coming you can uh we've got an imagine bot on there the mid journey bot so you can generate images and stuff like that or get help making character pictures and all kinds of cool stuff on there. I've tried my best to make it a really cool place to hang out with other like-minded individuals. Awesome. And Corey? Uh, you can find me around the internet. Uh, Primarily, you can find my writing and editing at womenwriteaboutcomics.com and comicsbeat.com. You can see me usually every other week on the True Crit stream where we are playing Outlaws of Alkenstar. I play Tapool, the Gripply inventor, uh, who is very much a Green Arrow build. With Love trick it. arrows and a fancy mechanical bow. And I. Uh, you can occasionally hear me as the wonderful, wonderful G Wow on, uh, on 50 North, the Goblin podcast side project of the 25 North crew. And the voice of Besmara. And the voice of Besmara. I need I need to do another one of those for you. Yes, yes. And if you're listening to this, you know who I am. Uh, Jason, GM of the 25 North Podcast and all the other side projects that we do. So uh, join our Discord and yeah, time for Spoiler Corner. All right, so... Absolutely, yeah. I, I, she is the catalyst in Rise of the Rune Lords, right? Yeah, like obviously she's not the the big bad of the adventure path, but she is the hook. You know, your your little sleepy 
seaside village gets attacked by goblin tribe and as you track down the uh, the offending goblins you find out that they are being led by a a woman who was part of of the village and was cast out due to her heritage and turned to the mother of monsters as an outcast and warped herself in Lamashtu's image and that's the first book boss is this priestess of Lamashtu and then from there it widely goes away from Lamashtu but that is the whole premise of the first book is tracking down this Lamash to cold. Yeah, I, I completely forgot about that. I, I was like, for some reason, I was like, wait, the Skinsaw cult and the Skinsaw murders had nothing to do with Lamash too, but, <laughs> but yeah, that's book two. That's book two. I think Nolly has got a really, really cool design too. Cause that was the first one my group ever played when we switched to Pathfinder. And, Upon finding out her story, where basically she's an Asimir and everybody's convinced that everything she do does is a gift from the gods, she basically just ran away because she hated the attention and happened to give birth near one of the uh, waters of Lamashtu, and it mutated her child, basically, and in her grief... Lamashtu's visions messed her up bad enough that she became a priestess of Lamashtu, basically. Mm-hmm. And it's a great character art. I don't think Lamashtu really plays much of a... I, have, I haven't played all the APs, but I don't know if she plays a huge role in any of the other ones, right? I can't think of any other ones that she plays a huge role in. Not even Wrath of the Righteous, where he, there's a lot of demon connections, because Wrath of the Righteous focuses on different demon lords. Yeah, I know that there was a side quest in the Kingmaker video game. There was a side quest where you had to track down a Lamashtan cult, but I think that was added to the video game. I don't think that was part of the AP. One thing that does come out of Wrath of the Righteous that is a spoiler corner topic is she is no longer the only Ascended Demon Lord. So, like, how that plays out in 2E is going to be fun to look at because that that upstart Nocticula is now a full goddess and uh, no longer just a Demon Lord, so... Um, also had an alignment shift along the way, which is also wonderful. <laughs> right. I think a lot of Lamashtu is just that she's um, she's not a driving force so much as she's kind of like a mutator for creatures to just get more interesting variants in the campaign so far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like it's one of those, it's one of those things where like she is so evil that like what can you really do with that? That's interesting. Yeah, you know? especially with how what she covers. It's it would be a very crass game to be able to throw her in and make her involvement meaningful, kind of. Yeah, I think that's the same reason they've not really done much with Zonkuthan, just because it's not that's that would be like some rated R adventures that need special advisory, and I just don't think that would suit most people. Yeah, they there there's an adventure path in um, Starfinder that deals with like the Shadow Realm and the Shadow Plane um, yeah. that has some like Zonkuthan vibes, but. It's it's more shadow realm and shadow plane stuff that yeah. um yeah. 
And it just tangentially includes Zonkuthon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Other than that, I don't know if there's much else to spoil about about um not and it's not and not even in the not even in the goblin one shots and like she we didn't get into it, but she does like she was the creator of the goblin hero gods. And those don't really they don't really even come up all that much, even in the goblin one shots. So for All my right. group, the biggest change for goblins in our group personally was that well, there's the 10 year gap between Pathfinder 1 and 2 and our biggest gap was that a bunch of um, tribes of goblins kind of broke away from Lamash 2 and are worshipping different gods and that's kind of why they went from stupid and bloodthirsty to hero or player characters more or less. Yeah. Yeah. Don't think there's any evidence for that in the lore very much, but that's what that's how we chose to explain it. All right. <laughs> <laughs>